Hello, everybody. Welcome back to art. This week, our prize winners are Cora in Mr. Boyer's class and Owen R in Miss Mortensen's class. Way to go, you two. This week, you'll receive some bonus art supplies in your supply pickup. This week for art, we are going to focus on the Harlem Renaissance. And our question that we're going to keep in our minds is how did these artists use their artistic expression to celebrate their heritage and their cultural identity? So let's start out by figuring out what is Harlem? So Harlem is in New York. I think it's fun to look at a map. In Google Maps, I go, okay, how long would it take us to take a field trip from Olympia to Harlem? So here we are in Olympia, 43 hours across the state to Harlem, New York. Okay, so Harlem was important in the 20th century because many African Americans moved into Harlem and other areas, um, northern urban areas, to escape all of the racism and prejudice and lack of opportunities that were in the South. And it's called the Great Migration. So through the 20s and 30s, Harlem became the capital, the symbolic capital for the Harlem Renaissance, which was a big movement. So what is the Harlem Renaissance? During the Harlem Renaissance, African-American art, music, poetry, kind of experienced what you'd call a rebirth. It became new again. Creative energy in jazz music, visual art, um, celebrated African American culture. And this was unique because it was one of the first artistic movements that focused on civil rights and reform. So it focused on showing African American history and experiences and demanding equal rights. And the Harlem Renaissance continues to shape the world that we live in today. The artist we are going to focus on today is Horace Pippin, and he always loved drawing. His right arm was injured when he was in World War I, so instead of drawing, he began burning designs into wood with a red hot poker, then filling them in with paint. Then later he moved into painting. He was self-taught, like many of the artists we learned about, or have learned about. He didn't go to school for art, and he was all about textured paintings. So either implied texture, which makes it look like it feels different, or actual texture. He would paint on wood. And I have a book to share with all of you. It's called A Splash of Red, and Horace Pippin's signature detail in his art is the contrast with some dark colors and then this pop of red. So this painting is called The Getaway. And you can take a moment to look at it. We are going to create our own fox drawing, or you can create whatever drawing you want, but include that splash of red, that contrast. Hi, everybody. I mostly wanted to show myself here because check out my outfit. I'm wearing a fox dress for today's lesson. Here's an example of what we're going to make. So up to you. Continue with the lesson on here or just use it as inspiration and draw your own picture. Have fun. You are going to begin with a plain piece of paper. If you want to use colored paper, that's awesome too. Brown would be nice or yellow. We are going to use crayons to create some implied texture. That means, so texture is what something feels like. When it's implied, that means that it looks like it would feel different, but it's not. I'm going to take a brown crayon, or you can do like different shades of brown, and I'm going to start drawing circles on my paper. And it's going to be a variety of sizes, and the outcome is going to be a fake wood, implied wood texture. Next, Bring your crayon to the top of the paper and you're going to draw a vertical line down the paper. But whenever you hit a circle, you're going to go around it. 
And the lines do not need to be straight. Okay, here's a circle going around it and down. around the circle. So keep doing that and fill up your whole paper with those circles and lines. Okay, now that I've done that, I'm going to take another brown crayon, different color. In your crayon selection, you should have a bunch of different shades of brown. And inside, I'm going to add a swirl in the circle, in each circle. And then you can add, like, go over different lines with different shades of brown. Because with wood, it's never or typically not just one brown, one color. There's little swirls of other colors in it. And I'm thinking how nice this would look if I had brown paper. It would really make it look even more wood-like. But with white, it's fine too. I'm going to rotate my paper to landscape, and you can draw the fox as small or as large as you want. I'm going to do a nice big fox. Now we're going to start with a black crayon, and we're going to just draw right over the wood texture. The wood is the background. So I'm going to begin with a nose on the left here. Just a black dot, and next is the head shape. So I'm going to draw a little curved line, then the head there, the chin, and its eye. You can do the eye however you want. I know people have their own favorite ways of drawing eyes. and two triangle, triangular ears on top. Next, I'm going to do its body. So starting at the neck, chin area, I'm going to bring it down to its stomach. And then the legs. The legs can be simple, just curved lines. This walk, fox is walking. I almost said this wax is full. <laughs> I don't know what I was saying. <sighs> okay. I just crack myself up sometimes alone in this portable. Now we're going to do its back. Just curves around. And then the signature fox look. It's not looking super fox like yet, but it's all about the tail. So it starts out a little skinny and then goes into a big foof and back to a point. And there we have the beginning of the fox. Little smile, sneaky grin. Now some markings on the fox. I'm going to start here and do some zigzagging lines. the chest, the stomach, then the end of the tail. Now it is time to add some texture. So continuing with your black line, we're going to draw some fur texture here. So just short dashed lines.
And again, this is called implied texture. Add some zigzaggy lines to the paws too. Okay, and like Horace Pippin, we're going to add that splash of red to create contrast. So I'm going to color everything red except the textured area and the paws. Here's my completed fox. If you want, you could draw uh, here's my crayon. If you want, you could draw a horizon line here, which shows there's something going on in the background. You could draw a farm, maybe some uh, stars in the sky, something in the foreground too, like some branches or grass. Whatever you want, you are the artist. Or you can leave it that way. So now I'm going to read a book all about Horace Pippin's life. So you can go ahead and stop the video and say, nope, no read aloud today, or go ahead and stay for the book. This book is called A Splash of Red, The Life and Art of Horace Pippin. I just love that name. Horace Pippin. On February 22nd, 1888, the town of Westchester, Pennsylvania celebrated a holiday. That day, in that same town, Daniel and Christine Pippin celebrated the birth of their son, Horace. Horace grew so fast so fast that his mother could barely keep up with the mending. He'll be a giant someday, the neighbors would say. Grandma Pippin would smile at Horace's long legs and big hands. She figured the neighbors were right. Grandma's hands were big too, rough and scarred from the slave days in Virginia. But they were just fine for giving Horace hugs. The biggest part of you, she told him, is inside where no one can see it. Then do you see the background of the wood there? When Horace was three years old, the Pippins moved to Goshen, 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 New York. As the family grew larger, everyone helped out. Horace put his big hands to work. He fetched flour for his mother. He sorted laundry with his sisters. He played with his baby brother. He held the horse while the driver delivered milk. At night, he piled wood for the stove and arranged dominoes so that his grandmother could play. Then, if he could find a scrap of paper and a piece of charcoal, he drew pictures. Pictures of what he'd seen that day. Horace loved to draw. He loved the feeling of the charcoal as it slid across the floor. He loved looking at something in the room and making it come alive again in front of him. He loved thinking about a friend or pet, then drawing them from the picture in his mind. At school, he sat quietly at his desk, but his big hands were always busy. Make a picture for us, Horace, his classmates said, and Horace did. His pictures made people happy, except when he made some next to his spelling list. That made the teacher mad. And you can see a spelling list with little pictures. I love that. I think that's a good idea. I'm sure our teachers at L.P. Brown would like that. Horace couldn't stop drawing. One day, Horace saw a funny face in a magazine. Draw me and win a prize, it said underneath. Horace drew the face and sent it off. A few weeks later, a package arrived. Inside, Horace found colored pencils, a pair of brushes, and a box of paints. Congratulations, said the note. Horace had won his first real art supplies. Paint a picture for us, Horace, his sisters cried. And Horace did. He painted everyday scenes in natural color. Then he added a splash of red. He needed money, so Horace quit school and went to work. For several years, Horace's big hands were always busy. 
stacking grain sa sacks at a feed store, shoveling coal at a rail yard, mending fences on a farm, carrying luggage at a hotel, making breaks in an iron factory. Packing oil paintings into large wooden crates. Looking at these made Horace remember winning the art contest. How proud he'd been, how he'd loved those colored pencils, those brushes and his first real box of paints. Horace was a big man now with big responsibilities. Still, he loved drawing as much as he always had. He used charcoal, broken pencils, whatever he could find. Make a, por make a picture for us, Horace, the other workers said, and Horace did. Far across the ocean, a terrible war had begun. Horace's big heart wanted to help. He joined the army and sailed away. In France, Horace and his regiment dug deep trenches for protection. There were no blankets or beds. It was always wet and cold and dark. I have not seen the sun in more than a month, Horace wrote. He wrapped his big hands around a rifle. Planes droned overhead. Shells exploded. If the fighting stopped for a while, Horace picked up a pencil. Make a picture for us, Horace, his soldier friends pleaded. And Horace did. He filled his notebooks one by one. One day, he climbed to the top of the trench and a shot rang out. Horace felt pain in his shoulder. He had been hit. Many hours passed before help came. The bullet had damaged his right arm. When it healed, he couldn't lift or move it the way he used to. Now, when people said, make a picture for us, Horace, Horace could not. After the war, Horace came back to the United States and met Jenny Wade. Jenny was a hard worker. She loved to cook. Horace was a hard worker, too, and he loved to eat. It was a good match. They married and settled down in Westchester. Horace was 32 years old and big and strong as ever. But because of his injured arm, he couldn't find a job. How much can you lift? The hiring boss asked, and that was the end of that. So Horace did what he could. He organized a Boy Scout troop. He umpired baseball games. He took the neighbor's kids fishing. When Jenny started a laundry business, Horace delivered the clean clothes. As he walked along, along the streets of Westchester, his fingers itched to draw all the colors and textures he saw. Lacy white curtains billowing in the windows, a splash of red geraniums blooming on a step, a yellow cat sprinting down an alley, deep green vines spiraling up a wall. At night, his old home in Goshen, his grandmother's slave days and the Bible stories she told made pictures in his mind. He longed to draw them, but how? His right arm was weak and painful to lift. The iron poker stood by the fire, straight and tall as a soldier. Could he? With his left hand grasped with his left hand, he grasped his right wrist. He thrust the poker into the flames until it glowed red hot. Using his good arm to move the hurt one, he scorched lines into the wood. Make a picture for us, Horace, the neighbor said, and Horace did. There's the fox. With practice, his arm grew stronger, his hand steadier. Every day, late into the night, Horace practiced painting. He used gray, black, and white, the somber colors of war. Here and there, he added a splash of red. You can see he still held his right hand with the left. He used 100 layers of paint, and he decorated the frame with tiny sculptures. Three years later, he finished. Now as he delivered laundry or fished in the river, new ideas came. He pa painted the milkman and his wagon, women working in the kitchen, children playing games, war scenes, Bible tales, men singing on the corner. Horace hung his paintings in a shoe store window. Five dollars each, said the sign. He hung the others in a restaurant. He even traded one for a haircut. People admired Horace's paintings, but no one bought them. Then the president of a local artist club saw Horace's pictures. Ooh, those are good, very good. Do you have more, the men asked. Horace showed them his work. He held his breath as they looked and talked. 
Finally, they said, you should have your own art show, a one-man exhibition right here in Westchester. Horace could hardly believe it. He shook hands with the men. When they left, he celebrated with Jenny. People came from all around to see Horace's paintings. Magazines wrote articles, reporters took photos. An art dealer told Horace he would help him sell his work. More than 40 years had passed since Horace won his first box of paints. Horace became famous. His paintings hung in big city galleries, museums displayed them, collectors admired them, movie stars bought them. Once again, Horace's big hands were always busy. And if you stood outside his house late at night, you might see him leaning toward his easel, his left hand holding up his right, painting the pictures in his mind. And then here's the real Horace Pippin. The end.